let me back up a bit. <laughs> In my experience, our bodies can guide us to our sort of unique form of intuition. This is Casey Berglund. She's a former nationally recognized dietitian who used to spend her time in the media and in the news until she had a what the F am I doing moment. And that's when she realized we could all make more purposeful decisions if we just listen to our body. The doubt and the questioning, especially when it comes to path and purpose, like who am I and what am I here for? Really deeply, truly. Like, I think one of the hardest parts about understanding body consciousness is our bodies don't speak with words. There isn't a language to describe often what is sensed in the body, which is why so many people use metaphor. Like, it feels like there's an elephant sitting on my chest. It's so easy to ignore intuition because we can't prove to our partners that it is so. Because there aren't words to describe why you just know that this is the right decision for you or that you have to do this big, bold move. You have to say yes and think big and be bold. So Casey, what I love so much about your mission and your purpose and what you speak about is I've heard you say that our bodies are able to lead us to the right decisions, to purposeful decisions. Our bodies, if we just listen to it, tell us what we need to be doing. Why is that? Our bodies have their own consciousness. So many of us are walking around from the neck up, living from the neck up, thinking, thinking, thinking our way through life and work and decisions and making pros and cons lists. And we forget that our bodies have our own consciousness and we're not tapping into a huge part of our genius. So obviously there's a, it's really a mind body. They're not separate. The body is part of the mind. The mind is part of the body. And when we learn how to attune to the body in particular, we are connecting with a type of wisdom that can make more thorough, thoughtful decisions. So I'm trying to do this more in my life, which is why I was so excited to talk to you because I'm like, this is just going to be a coaching session. <laughs> but I, I try to do this more where it's like, I know what I should do. Uh, yeah. I know what I kind of need to do. But I'm not good at judging what is like, ooh, my, my, I don't, something doesn't feel right. But I don't know if it doesn't feel right because it's not supposed to feel right because it's just uncomfortable and it's a new thing and I'm just imposter syndrome or whatever. Or this doesn't yeah. feel right because it's not something I mm -hmm. should be doing. Like, I just know that I don't feel good. And my brain has gotten really good at just overriding all of that stuff and thinking yeah. and thinking and thinking. And then I find myself saying yes to stuff I don't want to say yes to. I find myself out of control with my schedule. I find myself just trying to make everyone else happy. And I just don't have any energy or time to do things that I want. Yeah. That discernment around like kind of what is a no in the discomfort in the body and what is a maybe fear to work through is, I think, a really challenging thing for a lot of people that I work with. It's like, but wait, what does this body wisdom mean? And I have an annoying answer or response. <laughs> it's like, only you know, which is kind of annoying, but um, for whatever reason, yeah, a thanks, little story. That helps me a lot. Like, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. For whatever like, reason, a little story is coming to mind right now. I just drove to Texas and back by myself on this kind of like epic road trip. And really? why did you yeah. do that? Pardon me? Why did you do that? Well, I mean, good question. <laughs> um, I did it because I was stopped in my tracks. And my body's wisdom said, just stop, just be like, so there's obviously a story there. We've got like five stories weaving into one. Why did I do that? Well, I did a psychedelic journey that like kind of tossed my life upside down. And then I got COVID for the first time. I somehow escaped it for two years. And in the like fatigue and the illness and the physical kind of like despair. It was like, it was rough on me. But in that, I felt like there was also this sort of psychological, emotional purge or something. And I came out of COVID with this wisdom. For me, it shows up as a voice. So let me back up a bit. <laughs> our bodies, in my experience, our bodies can guide us to our sort of unique form of intuition. And there's so many different types of intuition. One of my primary forms of intuition is clear audience. So when I'm connected to my body, when I'm in an embodied state, I will often hear a voice. That voice for me has guided me to um, your dharma is love. That voice has told me, let go of your dietitian identity. That voice has told me like, get out of town. Maybe you should drive to Texas. And so 
as I'm speaking about this in this moment, it's like, of course, COVID is something that brings you into your body. It's kind of like you can't think your way through illness. Illness is like, makes you rest, you know, it's an embodied experience. And so while I was in the embodied experience of illness, this voice came through that was like, just stop. You need some time off. And I listened to it kind of, I was like, okay, yeah, I know. I I know I'm having a hard time recovering from this illness. Like I was super fatigued. I wasn't showing up with my full energy for my clients. And yet it was kind of like, okay, yeah. And then the voice was like, take, take three weeks off, take the rest of August off. And I was like, okay, okay. I, I get you. I'll listen to you. And then I looked at my schedule and it was packed. Like my, my coaching days were packed. And they, they aren't always, but of course they were. And so I told myself, my head told me, oh, well, you can just show up on those coaching days and take the other days completely off. And I tried, and then my body knocked me on my ass. I had to nap like four times in one coaching day. And then the voice came again, like, stop, you need the rest of this time off. So um, it led to me taking that time off, but it really was like a voice that would come through from an embodied moment. And then one thing led to another and I drove to Texas, but maybe I'll pause there. <laughs> That's like Seinfeld. Yada, yada, yada. Then I, <laughs> I was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Some people say I kind of look like Elaine. So that's like a, a, a good reference. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> uh, you know, they say, I say they say, but I believe, I'm sure you believe too, right? That we'll just keep getting presented with tougher and tougher and tougher moments until we finally listen. So the idea of like, I'm going to power through the coaching calls. Oh, wait, I can't do that. Like eventually yeah. you have to make the hard decision to clear your entire schedule and focus on Texas. You mentioned being guided by a voice. Yeah. This is, this is really interesting to me. I don't think I have that, but um, I definitely have these moments of clarity. Mm. where it's just like, oh, that's what I need to do. How do they arrive for you? Like, like, how do you just slow that down a little bit? I think that's really important. So for me, it's like a voice. There's something that happens in you right before that moment of clarity. What is that? So uh, my really good friend, Evan Carmichael, I, and listeners are so tired of me here talking about Evan. But anyway, my good friend, Evan, he, was, he released a new book, Momentum. He was on the podcast. We were talking about it. But he did this Momentum Challenge. And I've known Evan for 15 years. I shot his first YouTube video. I was in his first book. I've done a lot of firsts with him. But he said something for the first time that I never heard anyone else say. And he was talking about morning routines. And I've been in and out of my morning routine. But he said, the only point to a morning routine is to make sure that you're in the right mind space and the right mm-hmm. energy for whatever comes next. I and love I've that. I've never heard anyone say it quite that simply before. And, mm-hmm. and I'm a smart guy, but sometimes I really need people. <laughs> like, like my wife goes, do, you have to, do I have to spell it out for you? Yes, you have <laughs> to spell it out for me. And I realized, oh. And so I've started re-engaging with my morning routine. And sometimes I can't and sometimes I can uh, based on schedule. But the moments that I do, waking up, taking half an hour to loosen my body, making a, a coffee, And then I just go for like a 45 minute walk and I listen to a book on tape based off of whatever I feel like I want to be inspired by that day. Maybe it's, uh, I was working through a professor talk about the life of Agatha Christie. I don't read mystery novels, but I found it super interesting. I'm reading, I'm listening to some stuff from Damon John um, from, from, you know, Dragon's Den or, or I guess they call it Shark Tank in the States, you know, things like that. And so often about 10 minutes into my walk, I have to pause something because there's this little thing of excitement, this little thing that's like like a spark of like, oh, and what of? And then suddenly I realize I'm not even listening to the book. I'm not even paying mm. attention to what's happening. And it's in those moments of clarity. So I don't know if it's like, but I know that I have to be with my coffee on the walk, not for any reason, just in that moment. And then suddenly there's like room for my brain to have sift through all the crap to find the really the things I should be doing. Yeah. And Mark, if you were my coaching client and I was listening to you tell this story, I want to just reflect back to you that as you told this story about the moment of clarity, yes, you're talking about the podcast. You're talking about this, like this little like ping coming through your body. You did this with your hand and for podcast listeners, I'm like shaking it. And then you literally like lifted up in your body and your heart opened. So there was like a little expansion that happened in your body. And I just want to reflect that back to you, that your body is always telling a story. So when I'm coaching someone, I'm listening to what they say, and I'm also watching their body and mirroring their body back. And that is a great gateway into them 
understanding what they're doing in, in their bodies. Like, I don't know if you even noticed what was happening in your body as you were just recounting the story, but that is a clue to what happens in your body in those moments of clarity. That is super cool. No, I did not notice that. But you know, my wife, so, so we have a dog and, and I exercise a lot and I walk a lot. My wife often says, why don't you take the dog with you? And I was like, no, you know, I had Julia Cameron who wrote The Artist's Way and she talks about <sighs> artist walks. I, I had her love on a podcast. Her amazing. And she said, don't take the dog. Don't take people. Don't she, she doesn't even want you to take headphones. But I said, no, you know, so I tried taking the dog and I realized no moments of clarity. Sometimes my daughter, my youngest daughter on a weekend wants to come with me and secretly Mm -hmm. I'm like, "Ah, it's not my walk anymore. Um, And there's something about just, and I don't even walk fast. I don't even walk with purpose. Um, I don't even pay attention. This morning I went on the walk. I I, I don't even remember most of it. Mm -hmm. It's Mm -hmm. just for, for once, for some reason, it's me just doing something for no reason other than I know that if I don't do it, I have it. Yeah. If I do do it, I, yeah. I, I have an amazing day and I don't know what it is about those 45 minutes. I mean, it sounds like you're in a state of flow in those moments. And, and that state of flow is a higher level of consciousness and energy. And we just create better from that higher level of energy. So I, I love hearing this story. Huh. Okay. So, so <laughs> yada, yada, yada. Circle back to you the to go to Texas. <laughs> yeah, well, and the only the reason that I shared that is because 15, 20 minutes from my house, I got rear-ended. Oh. And my initial like instinct or thought was like, okay, if that's not a sign, then I don't know what is. Like I should turn back. Like so you got the, rear-ended on your way to Texas? Like 15 minutes from my condo in Calgary. <laughs> So you're doing right. like a 30 hour drive or something and 15 minutes from home, something goes wrong. Right. And so there was this moment where it was like, okay, I got to turn back. Like fear, just literally my nervous system went into fight, flight, freeze. And the thought from that embodied state was turn back. Like that's a sign kind of thing. And the reason that I'm sharing it is like, okay, is it a sign? What is the sign? Is it really to go back home or is it actually to move through that fear and continue along? I share this story because it's kind of similar to the body. You feel this discomfort in your body. You get rear-ended in your body. There's like heaviness in your heart. You might name it as anxiety. There's a knot in your stomach. You might call it nervousness. And there's this opportunity to either kind of just like react quickly and avoid the discomfort and do what you would maybe do, go back up into your head, continue on, push through. Or perhaps there's another message that's coming from that bit of wisdom. And so in my TEDx talk, I came up with this acronym, the body acronym. So B stands for breathe. O is observe. D is delay. And we're going to come back to delay. And Y is say yes. So in order to attune to body wisdom, We often need to slow some shit down because our minds like to be busy, busy, busy. But up here in the head, there are truths. There is logic, of course. And there's stories, conditioning, what we think we should do, what our wife thinks about this scenario. You know, like we just consider so many other perspectives that are kind of like conditioned in on autopilot when we're not tuned into our bodies. So We need to slow down a little bit and create a bit of presence and space for that attunement. So even for you on your walk, when you have the dog or when someone comes with you, it takes you out of your flow. My guess is that it keeps you from the level of like presence that allows wisdom and clarity to come through for you. So this is like different for everyone. But when we breathe, we're regulating our nervous system. We're coming into a more calm, grounded state. Each of us has our breath and it just like automatically happens. But when we attune to it, we can navigate and manage so much of our inner experience just through using the breath. So breathing can often help us come into a regulated nervous system state. Very useful for getting to the truth of body wisdom. The O observe is about observing sensation. Now, Often I am referring to like physical sensation, but we can consider thought, feeling, uh, smell, like all of that is sensation. 
Exactly. All of it's yeah. sensation. But specifically when we attune to how it shows up in the body, like, ooh, I feel, I feel a pulsing in my left fingertip. You know, who pays attention to that? <laughs> but that has a message. This like sensation, this heaviness in my heart, that has a message. And so the D is delay. That means don't fix it, just feel it. There's something about widening that gap, having some space. So around the sensation, like I often feel um, anxiety in my chest. I often feel like a tension there. It constricts, it contracts. And when I can breathe and observe and create space around it, it's almost like there's nuance to it. There's a softening around it. And I find that that's maybe the hardest part and the most important part because it's in that space, it's in that capacity to be with the discomfort that the intuition and the discernment around like, what does this mean for me can come alive. So for me in the car accident, getting rear-ended, my nervous system went totally into fight, flight, freeze. I was shaking. And the thought or instinct that came from that is go back home, you can't continue but I wasn't regulated. And then as things continued, it was my first accident. I called insurance. I went to the police station. And as I got more information and figured out more how to handle this hard situation, it was hard for me, this hard situation. It's like my nervous system was able to settle more and more. And I actually love what you said earlier about how sometimes your wife needs to spell things out for you. <laughs> like yeah. sometimes we need other people. We call this co-regulation in the like embodiment or nervous system space where we regulate our nervous systems, come back to a grounded state with other people. Sometimes we need help from other people when we're sort of out of, there's something called our window of tolerance. Yeah. So for me, I went to the police station and this police officer was like, where were you off to? And I'm like, well, I was on an epic trip to Texas, but, uh, you know, and, and then she's like, is that your Bronco out there? Your brand new Bronco got rear-ended? And I was like, yeah. And there was something about this little bit of conversation, this rapport building that sort of calmed my system. Mm -hmm. And she gave me the damage report and the little sticker for the inside of the window. And she looked me in the eyes and she was like, enjoy your trip. And something happened for me where it was like, I needed her in that moment. She just planted a little seed that created an opportunity for me to actually slow down and check in with my body about what I really did want to do once my nervous system came down. You know who she was for you? Who? She was, your, she was the empathetic witness. She was. I had three of them that day. And, yeah. And, and I, this, this changed my whole approach to parenting. And my my wife and my clients and everyone because I, I'm a dude so like I want to fix it I want to fix it I'm a problem solver I'm an <laughs> entrepreneur it's like tell me your problem and I will fix it my yeah. wife gets so mad because she thinks that I'm telling her what to do she's well, like Jesus. just hold space for me <laughs> last, last like week creative. she actually just goes you know what if you were a girlfriend I would just be bitching to you about what's going on I don't want you to fix this and it's like yeah. we've been together for a long time and I was like. Right. Okay. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just giving you options now. And, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's the idea of the empathetic witness. It's like, yeah. there are certain things that I actually can't fix. And, yeah. and it's just like, that really sucks. I'm so sorry that happened to you. Gosh, that must feel terrible. Mm -hmm. And now let's put this into perspective, right? Like you got a ding, your vehicle's yeah. still roadworthy. Yeah. This can be fixed when you return, right? Like it's just that, that person who just helps you realize this is not life or death. <laughs> Totally. Yep. That was exactly it. And then it was a woman at the body shop who did the estimate for the back of my vehicle that I went to next. And there was something about them being women and being kind of like there was an energy around them. They were sort of mirroring my own energy, like kind of courageous. I take risks. I do solo road trips across the country and down to the States and like, I'm brave, you know, and I'd kind of like forgotten that about myself in that moment. But the woman who did the estimate for the for my vehicle for getting fixed, she was like, you know, parts probably won't come in for another month and the vehicle drives and, you know, enjoy your trip. And so it gave me this opportunity. I, I kind of drove to the outskirts of the city and still I was scared, but I pulled into an approach to a farmer's field and I turned my vehicle off and I sat and I did my body acronym exercise. I like took some breaths and I observed my body, different sensations. There was like, um, almost, I was still vibrating a little bit. So I still felt this 
fear inside my system, though I was more calm than when it first happened. I noticed, you know, okay, my feet are on the ground. I'm okay. Like, this is fine. I kept breathing and I noticed my system start to shift. And just the observation of those different sensations and then the delay, like, okay, I'm feeling this. What is this? And for me in that moment, it was kind of like, is this a sign? Am I going west back to my condo where I've spent the last two years of my life? Or am I going south on an adventure to like, I don't know, discover or reclaim a part of me that I used to know? And it became so clear in the delay what my next step is. That's when I heard the voice. The voice was, just make it to your brothers, which was seven hours away. And I trusted it. And that's what I did. I love everything about that story. I mean, for our listeners, you can't see that over my shoulder, but the viewers know, you know, think big, be bold, say yes, is, is yes. Um, something that came to me maybe a decade ago. And I, to the point where I actually had to, I had to kind of like look up if, if I somehow stole this from someone else. Like it just seemed to make so much sense and click so well for me in life. Like think big, be bold, say yes. Yeah. Because I think small by nature, we all do. I'm not as bold as I should be. And I say no on defaults to almost everything. And so I love the idea of take a moment to breathe, mm -hmm. of observe what you're feeling. And the other thing that I just learned this year, I don't know if it was The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck by Mark Manson or mm -hmm. what book it was, because I read a lot of stuff and it kind of all overlaps. This idea that there's no bad emotions. Like, mm. like, like so many of us, I was raised. There's this, there's this idea of like the good boy problem, right? Like, you know, be a good girl, be a good boy. We, we are raised to try and please others and please our parents. I was raised in a family where it's like, try not to be too loud. Try not to use too much energy. I realize now that I was raised in a household where we were not allowed to have... Like playing and having fun was like a yeah. big no-no because I don't actually know how to play and have fun really. But I, I know that there are, are good emotions and there are bad emotions, right? Like anger is a bad emotion or jealousy or envy or, uh, you know, like there's just all these bad emotions versus good ones. And so it was a breakthrough for me to realize like there's no good or bad emotions. Like emotions carry no morality to them. Mm -hmm. They simply are indicators of how you're feeling based off of how in or out of alignment you may be with what you want or desire. And so I love this body, right? Breathe, observe, delay, say yes. Because in the, in the observing what's happening and in the delay, so we're responding and not reacting to things. And in exactly. saying yes to the difficult or uncomfortable things, you so have been able to represent a lot of the things I believe in that I've not figured out how to articulate, frankly. Mm. It's hard to articulate. Like the, I think one of the hardest parts about understanding body consciousness is like our bodies don't speak with words. Like there isn't a language to describe often what is sensed in the body, which is why so many people use metaphor. Like it feels like there's an elephant sitting on my chest. There's like, it's hard to articulate. And yet, sometimes for better or worse, it's the articulation of sensation that validates it. So like my job as an embodied coach, or I get people into their bodies and then ask them questions from that place and use my intuition and some of my sort of empathic gifts to support them with trusting that wisdom in whatever way they need to. But part of it is I provide a language. I provide an articulation for something that doesn't have a language. It's so easy to ignore intuition because we can't, you know, prove to our partners that it is so because there aren't words to describe why you just know that this is the right decision for you or that you have to do this big, bold move. You have to say yes and think big and be bold. Like it's hard to do sometimes. Um, but I think that work is worthwhile. Like. I believe that we should be able to trust our body's wisdom without having to prove it to anyone, without having to have a language for it. And yet that's hard to do. That's, that, that's courage right there. Like what you're asking for to like, we've been so well trained to try to rationalize emotional decisions mm -hmm. and our wants and our desires and our dreams and uh, to give into fear and to comfort and to all of those things. Like we've just been so well trained that the idea of doing something 
that not only others will question, not only you question, that has tons of uncertainty, that you're not sure if it how it will work out. But on top of that, the only thing you have to go on is <laughs> your gut reaction or what your body is trying to tell you that you secretly want. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I can get other people to believe me. I'm not even sure I can get myself to believe it. Like that, that yeah. sounds like courage right there, what you're describing. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, we're conditioned not to believe it, right? Yeah. And yet everybody has a story about like, oof, I knew it and I ignored that red flag, you know, whether it's a partner that they should have broken up with a long time ago, or whether it was a move that they wish they would have made, like talk about courage. Like our bodies literally guide us to the truth of what we need. And yet often the truth takes courage to look at. The truth isn't always easy. doesn't always flow. Yeah. You talk about the partner that you got to take a cold, hard look at the move that you need to make in your career. I know in your story that a trip to India really changed your perspective and, and actually changed your whole direction in life. Can you can you share that with us? Mm, yeah. I mean, I, I went to India twice and both times spent time in an ashram in Rishikesh, which is the birthplace of yoga. And both times I had one of those experiences. I feel like this is my life's initiation to constantly be hit with these big awarenesses that require me to take bold moves and say yes. So, I mean, the first time was the fall after I had driven across Canada, I was teaching workshops across the country and I fell in love in Nova Scotia and Cape Breton Island. I met a man and it was like a romantic fairy tale. Uh, I don't know. We could have made a movie. I met him because of a Buddhist nun who I'd met the day before in a coffee shop, you know, like all the crazy ass stories. We call that a meet cute in the industry. I think it, a meet cute for sure. It was a total meet cute. Um, and I don't know. I feel like everyone has to have one of these types of relationships that are a bit of a roller coaster, but they're like real fun at the start. Anyway, I had gotten into this relationship. He drove back across the country after I had gotten home and moved in with me. It all moved way too fast. I learned a lot of lessons through that relationship, but I was with him the first time I'd gone to India. Not He didn't come with me, but we were in relationship together. And so some of the real things started to reveal themselves. And I had just felt like, gosh, why am I feeling so angry? Like, why am I having like dreams that are connected to him? And I thought this was all like, it, it's supposed to be so good. Like, why am I feeling this way? And at that same time, I was also questioning my path as a dietitian, as a mindful eating dietitian. I was a dietitian for a decade. And I mean, I'd literally just driven across the country teaching these yoga for mindful eating workshops. I was a spokesperson for Dietitians of Canada. I, I got these all expenses paid trips to with the food industry. And I was like, uh, something about this doesn't feel right anymore. So I'm in India sitting in the ashram. Uh, an ashram is like kids camp for truth seeking adults. It's like very structured. A bell goes in the morning to wake you up to go to meditation at 5.20 a.m. You have yoga at six. There's a real ritual and routine to the life in the ashram. Anyway, so one day I'm sitting there and I'm in meditation and I am, you know, breathing. I'm just watching, observing the sensations in my body. I'm noticing all this uh, tension, really, like my neck and shoulder are tight. I have this like heavy sensation in my chest, like a knot in my stomach. And I just stayed with it, you know, just observed it, delayed. And this wisdom came through that was like, you got to get out of this relationship. You know, like, you're not supposed to feel this way. And also, while you're at it, let go of your dietitian identity. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, talk about a couple bangers. And yet, because I'd had, I'd had like one or two, I realize now that these moments have occurred for me since I was a little kid. And that in many ways, that voice has kind of like saved me, you know, it saved me from an eating disorder when I was 14. It saved me from like bullying when I was younger than that. And I just kind of realized like, for whatever reason, I have learned how to trust that voice. And so when I'm sitting in the ashram in India and, and it downloads in that big, abrupt way, there was kind of an inherent trust in the moment. I was like, okay. There's my answer. Like these undeniable truths, when they hit you, they hit you. 
And so that was it for me. But then, of course, I think this is part of the path too. Of course, we get tested. So I came back from that trip to India. And five days after I returned, I got an email from another like media dietitian inviting me to this trip at uh, General Mills headquarters to like cook in the Betty Crocker kitchens and try out these new food products and get wined and dined at this fancy hotel. And when it happened, my whole body contracted because I knew it was a dangling carrot. And I also knew I was going to say yes to it. I also knew I wasn't going to listen to my India wisdom about letting go of my dietitian identity and moving into the deeper work that I knew I was being called to. And I share that because sometimes it's easier when you're sitting in an ashram in India. Or for me, I've had these sort of truth bombs go off in silent retreat centers in Indonesia. Like you're you're on your own, you're in a controlled environment. And then I think the real test is how much can you trust that wisdom when you're in your friend group and your friends have different opinions or when you're dropped into a work situation and you get offered a raise, even though you know you're working your way out or you want to be working your way out. I feel like there's often this test that comes after a truth. It's like the universe is kind of saying, are you sure? Are you sure? It's like when, I don't know, for me, I'll have like a week, a month where I bump into all of my ex-boyfriends on the street, but it's kind of like, wait, why are you showing up right now? Why is this happening right now? So in many ways, my experience has been that like this body wisdom business for me, there's definitely like a spiritual side to it. For me, there's like this um, connection to a higher energy that comes through this body wisdom. And I don't know, it's like the tests come shortly after the truth is yeah. heard or yeah. felt. Do you yeah. experience that too? 100%. 100%. You know, let me put this another way. There's a reason why people are so successful on The Biggest Loser. They go on The Biggest Loser <laughs> in a controlled environment, yeah, uh, surrounding themselves with every possible coach, every possible moment, other people who want to do the exact same thing as them, and they can have the most amazing transformations. And then they go home. And then they go home. And something, I, I don't know the exact stat, but almost nobody is able to maintain yeah. the weight loss. Almost everyone returns. There's a reason why lottery winners win so much money yeah. and then end up bankrupt overwhelmingly you know, a few years later. It's, yeah. it's because you can have that truth bomb. You can have that moment of clarity. You can have the moment of decision. You can even go home and start to make the sacrifices, start to do the hard things, start to... But you'll hit a certain point where fear and where doubt and where things take longer than you thought they would and they're yep. harder than they thought they would and you underestimate it. <laughs> just the, the learnings or the lessons or just the uncomfortable feeling of not being very good at this new thing that you're doing. Like, I totally. think most people would probably say, hey, Casey, I think you threw away an amazing career as a national leading dietitian. I did. You threw I it did. away. What I did waste. on purpose. And it yeah. was the best thing I ever did. Why? It's... The best thing you've ever done? That's not... well, Anyone who that... hasn't been through it would think that that is bananas. It It's like... There is nothing better than trusting your own truth. There's nothing better than belonging to yourself. There's nothing better than like, I don't know. I, I had a conversation with my farmer brother the other day who was giving me business tips and money tips. And I like love him dearly and really wise. And I told him, you know what, brother? I did Maslow's hierarchy upside down. I went right into the self-actualization path. <laughs> I went right that, into that, it. That 2%, right? I've been intensely in a like healing journey for the last 15 years. I've, you know, who, you know, stays in ashrams in India and does like psychedelic journeys? Who even, like, so many people don't even go to therapy. You, right? sound, you sound a bit like a hippie, which I'm kind which of secretly, a hippie. which secretly I told my wife about a year ago. I'm like, I'm becoming a big hippie, just so you know. I like to think I'm a grounded hippie. I like to think okay. I'm still like of the earth and, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but but I mean, in terms of a spectrum from like uh, accountant to, yeah. to to hippie, you lean more one way than the other, let's say, right? For sure, for sure. Yeah. Gosh, you're making me really think about it now. I'm like, that might've been a reactive statement. Um, I just, there's being an in integrity with myself. I'm going to speak from the eye. It just feels good. 
It just feels right. Like being in integrity, being truthful. I think in my experience, when I have lied to myself, you know, when I've lied to myself, when I've gone down a path that isn't my path to go down, it like there's instant gratification that comes with that. I belong to the group or I, you know, we talked about people pleasing and and doing things for others. There's like, I am loved here. I belong. It's like a hit of instant gratification that for me eats at my soul over time because it's not mine. It's not my truth. It's not what's in, in integrity for me. For me, like thinking big, being bold and saying yes is me listening to my path. And of course that involves others. Like, I don't know, it just feels so important. My relationships are so connected and so deep. The way in which I connect with people, I drove to Texas and back and every single person I met said something to me after. It it kind of brings me to tears because it matters and it's meaningful about how inspired they felt or how much love they felt in, in my presence. And it's like, I am aligned. I I know what my purpose is. It is that unconditional love, you know, and I follow my truth. And that means that I can hold your truth. I have been to the depths of my dark emotions. And that means that I can hold space for yours. Some of my clients are like, you're the only person that I can be myself with. And I think that's a shame. I wish they were surrounded by people who saw them deeply, truly. And I just know that it's because I listen to myself that I can hold that space for other people. Um, it matters. I have the accolades or I have the things that like light up my ego and make me feel important on a superficial level, aka the success I had as a dietitian. I don't know. There's some point in someone's like corporate career where no amount of money can make up for the calling that they feel deep inside of themselves. And to me, that's the biggest, boldest, bravest move someone can make is listening to that voice inside and trusting it and then surrounding themselves with people who cheerlead the shit out of that, who want to do that themselves. And then you grow this different type of success. Like so many people think like, oh, you make the choice for your craft, for your art, for your passion, for your purpose at the sacrifice of money. And I'm like, bullshit. Bullshit. We need you to be you. You're going to be the most successful on the physical plane. I genuinely believe by living in alignment with what you're here for. Do the inner work. Discover what that is. Your relationships will improve. We live in a world, it's normal. I'm on a rant right now, but I hope it's okay. (laughs) It is normal. Let me just say this what is normal in our leadership is leading from a victim mentality, a blame mentality, a low level of consciousness. Just because that's normal doesn't mean that it's the way that it should be. Just because it's normal to be on anti-anxiety and anti-depression meds doesn't mean, and I'm pro like medication when you need it and when it empowers you, but there's a lot of it. We're not doing well as a society. That's normal. Our normal is a low effing bar. And so if we're just doing what we see around us, and maybe we're not yet surrounded by people who are in truth, are in authenticity, are in integrity, are doing rad shit in the world, then it's all too easy to shrink, to settle, to stay in an abusive relationship or in a a job that's sucking your soul or to be... um, There's this term in yogic wisdom called dharma. Dharma is like life purpose, this reason for being. To be like just beside your dharma and to live your whole life like that rather than stepping straight into the center of it and letting your gifts truly transform yourself and the people around you. And it doesn't have to be in a big way. It could be in a small way that nobody else sees, but you're living your dharma. To me, that alignment, it's really illuminating a value system for me, inner integrity it feels good. I am free. I am so free. Yeah. Maybe I'm a hippie. I'm free. And I create freedom in other people in their inner world. And I'm on this journey, right? But to show how legit and valid and practical that is in our 3D world, we can make money doing that too. And also money isn't everything there is. The truth is what you're describing is not easy. And we want things to be easy. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, 
maybe it's cliche to say easy now, hard later, hard now, easy later, right? True. Boil it down. But but we want things to be easy and it's just never going to be, right? Like either we we make the hard decisions, we do the hard things, we fear the judgment, we fear the loss, we fear not making money, we fear mm-hmm. all of those things, or we have the, the creature comforts, let's say, mm-hmm. right? Maybe we have the career, maybe we have the salary, maybe we have, um, you know, the toys and the distractions and, and maybe we can mix in, um, you know, some vacations and some drugs and alcohol to help keep us from getting too bored and some Netflix and all that other stuff just to help like distract us from the fact that most of the time we spend stuff doing that we don't want to do. Mm-hmm. And um, I think a lot of people have settled for that. I think people today are questioning that more than ever, but I- I've had to struggle with this myself. Uh, you know, a big thing that, that that's a big turning point for me was, and it was more like I was just looking for validation. I was looking for some, I, I didn't have the breakthrough that you had because I didn't go to India and I didn't hang out and I didn't have the wisdom of, of a yogi to, to be able to help direct me or anything. Uh, so I was just looking for answers. And, and part of what helped me, Man's Search for Meaning, was a, a great book when mm. I needed it by Viktor Frankl, uh, mostly to go like, oh man, um, my problems aren't real problems. Uh, yeah. and, and then the next book that I stacked into that was, um, was the, the Five Regrets of the Dying by, by Bonnie Ware, um, which just helps highlight the five common things that, that people often regret at the end of their life. And I, I asked myself the question, you know, if, if I'm, I'm in my late thirties, if, if I'm going to spend, my, if I can live to spend my forties and my fifties and my sixties and my seventies and my eighties, and hopefully part of even my, maybe my nineties with passions and with careers and with relationships and with my kids and hopefully my grandkids and hopefully my great grandkids. And if I have all that stuff ahead of me, um, could I forecast what regrets I might have? Mm-hmm. Could I, Make changes now, and could I live a life that just avoids those things? Um, and it felt completely reckless. It felt mm-hmm. completely crazy. It felt, uh, but I made the decision. I had the moment of clarity, uh, the truth bomb, as you described. I made the decision. I made the moves. What I didn't account for is just how long it takes to turn a ship that is your life. <laughs> yeah. Your business your career, your relationships, your mindset, uh, the patterns, that the stories you tell yourself, yeah. even, even with some therapy, even doing this, even connecting yeah. with amazing people. Um, what I didn't anticipate was over the, the year, the two years, the three years, the four years, the five years, however long this journey will take to get to finally a point where I'm like, hey, bravo, I think I finally turned the ship. Um, I didn't anticipate just how many times I would continually re-question whether this was smart or not or just try to run back to the safety of what was. Did, yeah. did you have that when, as you worked through your transition? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's an evolution. I think that's part of it. I think the doubt and the questioning, especially when it comes to path and purpose, like who am I and what am I here for? Really deeply, truly. That will evolve until I die. For me, the deep truth that has stuck with me is, and it totally came from, from an embodied kind of a mystical experience that was about love and putting words to it cheapens it because the embodied experience of that knowing that like, that's what I'm here for. It was so profound. There's no words to describe the felt sense of it, but it was like, if I can ground into this, you know, and so that part is the underlying foundation, but I change. Thank goodness. You know, I change and my path changes and I get off track, you know, and then you got to steer the ship back. You got to go to Texas every now and again. Well, literally, why do you think I went? Why do you think I went? Like, yeah, there was that like, just stop. But in the stop, it was like, do you even want to be an entrepreneur anymore? Is this your path? Do you like working with clients? Are you fulfilled? Like I've been through those questions many times. And I was prepared. What was I looking for? I was looking for, is there a place I'm meant to move to? Is there a different type of work I'm meant to do? Is there my life partner? Is, are, are they out here somewhere? Am I going to find, I'm going to find something on a journey, you know? And basically by the time I got back, I got back at 3 a.m. on a Sunday, I drove kind of through the night and I woke up the next morning feeling a sense of like wholeness and fullness. And I'm like, ah, shit, 
it's me. It was like the fullness of me I was looking for. Right, right. There you are. Right. You just forgot about, you forgot about the part that was brave. I forgot about the part that was brave, that took risks, that could get rear-ended and continue anyway. You know, that whole trip was reminding me how I move through fear. And it wasn't anything outside of me that I was meant to find. It was a reclamation of parts of me. And it wasn't like, okay, stop doing everything you're doing and do something new. It was like, nope, Case, you're on the right path. Keep serving your people. And also like those things you haven't done in the last two years because you've been scared since COVID, like that is still part of your path. Like it's time to put your big girl pants on and scale. And also write, create for creation's sake. I was trying to fit all my creativity into my business. It was shrinking my creativity. So I created a separate platform and I've been writing every single day. Julia Cameron, The Artist's Way, her morning pages are like, oh, they're my morning routine. I do morning pages every day. And then I challenge myself. It was my birthday yesterday. And I challenge myself for a gift to myself. Thank you for a gift to myself to write and publish every day, just as an experiment. You know, to like use my voice again. I love that. On my birthday, um, the year COVID hit, 2020, I guess, on my birthday, because uh, in our team, we give everyone their birthdays off. um, Not as a vacation, just take take the day off. And I never did that because it's like, I just had too much to do. But on my birthday in 2020, amongst all of the craziness, I'm born March 24th. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember when (laughs) things went south, March 13th, March 12th. Yeah. So we're only two weeks into this. The world is burning around us. I'm freaking out. Um, I'm like, what I gave myself was the day off to rebuild my website. And I had so much fun. Hmm. And to, to what you just said, I have worked for the last 10 years. You know, This is my third podcast. I wanted to podcast, but I felt like if I didn't do it for business reasons, it would be a waste of effort or time or I couldn't justify or rationalize why I should do it. So I created a business podcast, which was good. And then... Like I've always wanted to try and force my creation. I love making things. Mm-hmm. I really do. I love helping people figure out who they need to be and what is the most strategic thing for them to do. And I like just making stuff. Yeah. And I've always gone like, if I'm going to make something, it better be for a reason. It better be efficient. It better have ROI. I can't pl- like the video games I love to play. I love to play SimCity and all these games where you make things. I, yeah. can't, I can't do it. I can't bring myself. One day I spent seven hours building civilization something that was three or four years ago, never picked up the game again. Because at the end of the day, I went, if I'm going to put all this creative energy into making something, I want to make something efficient. I want to make something proper, right? Mm -hmm. And so I only had the realization just a few months ago where it's like, oh, I. but what what I didn't do in this, what I didn't realize is what you're doing is is subconsciously I was actually limiting my creativity mm-hmm. because I don't want to always create for work. Yeah. So I would stop. I, I, I take cold showers. I, or I end every shower with a cold shower. And then I realized somewhere along the way, some days I skipped showering. You might think that's gross, whatever. I don't really care. But I didn't realize that the reason I was skipping showering on certain days was because I just didn't want to face the cold shower. Huh. The reason why I stopped, I stopped creating is because I would only create for work. And then I was like, ooh, that's not good. Yeah. And so we have to like give ourselves the space to do all the stuff you're talking about. Yeah, totally. I unkinked my creative hose and now she's pouring through, baby. <laughs> do, you have a hard, do you have a hard out right now or do you have a few more minutes? I got time. This okay. is delightful. <laughs> okay, cool. You unkinked your creative hose. <laughs> uh, that's an Instagram post right there. I like that. Uh, so for those who are listening who go, I believe that Casey believes this. Mm-hmm. Right? Just like I, I believe that Bonnie believed the people dying mm-hmm. with five regrets of the dying. And I believe that the people dying regretted those things. But it doesn't necessarily mean that I will or won't regret those things. Like there's a, there's a huge leap of faith. Totally. That, that Bonnie knows what she's talking about, that these people who are passing away know what they're talking about, and that me adjusting my entire life is worth it. So I think anyone listening will believe that you believe it. 
that it was worth, <laughs> quote unquote, throwing away your career and all these things. What would you say to someone who's a little skeptical, though? You don't have to believe me. Listen to your body. I don't <laughs> think that's that the, the only perfect answer. I don't think that's the only path. You know, like you're just listening to my story. You're the one that knows. There's gentler, sometimes gentler approaches are much better for the nervous system. You know, people win the lottery. We talked about that. And then they lose all their money. Receiving huge amounts of money can be really triggering for the nervous system. And if your nervous system can't handle it, you'll, you were naturally drawn to kind of go back to what's comfortable. And so slow and steady is a good move for a lot of people. (laughs) And giving your nervous system an opportunity to integrate change over time. You know, starting a side gig while you're getting paid well from your corporate job is awesome. Learning under someone else's dime. Like, I want to say that my story is my story. And you know what's true for you. Your body knows what's true for you. Start to tune in. Use the body acronym exercise. Take some breaths. Observe what you feel. Just give your body a little bit more space. It requires that you slow the F down, you know, and you tune in, you check in every so often, maybe as your morning routine, like that's the place to start. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got was from uh, a business person on the podcast who decided he wanted to be an actor Mm -hmm. and, you know, became an action action film actor and producer, finance, found people to finance this movie. It was like number one movie in Netflix UK for a while. And like, anyway, at the end, after the podcast was done, I was talking to him and I was asking some advice. This is a, 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 around a season where I had this big moment of decision with what I wanted to do with my business and where I wanted to go. And I, I was looking for permission. I was looking for permission from others to let go of the things that I knew for years that I didn't want to do, mm-hmm. but just felt I couldn't let go of. And I'm, I'm just a ball of nerves uh, for many, many months, maybe even years. And he's like, <laughs> You're, what you just said reminded me of his advice. Mark, just chill the fuck out. Yeah. And, and I was like, but yeah, but, and he's just like, just chill the fuck out. I think yeah. you're over, he's like, I think you're overthinking this, bud. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, okay, I'll try. Yeah. And uh, I'm still uncomfortable with it, but um, my days are, are more peaceful and my schedule is I'm in more control of, and I get fewer of other people's panics that suddenly turn into something that I have to deal with. Um, And more opportunities are not only presenting themselves to me, but I'm actually open to receiving them. And I, cause I have just more time, more time, more energy to say yes to things. I I, I love the, I, I love what you're about. And I love that, that I can talk to you because more than anything, you can just help remind me of some of the lessons I've learned that I forgot along the way. Yeah. And I need to get better at just when I feel that, when I feel that, um, that truth to accept it and, and, to, and to move on to what's next as opposed to just like quietly tucking it away and going, because I have a habit of going like, oh, that was a real breakthrough. Uh, okay, three days from now, I'll take action on that or like try to schedule or like I'll circle back around on this later yeah. as opposed to just being in the moment right away. Mm. Yeah, I really feel the alignment in in the things that we're about. You know, I just keep looking at the think big, big, be bold, say yes in the background there. And I'm like, how did I not notice that right off the get go? <laughs> you know? Yeah, I we appreciate all need you. To do that. We all need to do that. So final question I do have for you, though, uh, for you at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Love. That's your dharma. How, what, what does that mean? That means that my purpose is who I be. Uh, My purpose is what I do when I'm my most authentic self in every single moment. So yeah, that is true in my work when I'm coaching someone. I know that if I just create a space that has unconditional love and non-judgment, they're going to work their shit out, you know? But when I'm bumping into a stranger on the street and engaging in conversation with them, It's like bringing an energy of love, not romantic love, not cheap love, like unconditional love. Like I want you to be you and feel safe to be yourself in my presence. So, I mean, that's what that means to me. That's what drives me. That's what gets me out of bed in the morning. And it's, I've made the mistake. I've made the mistake of thinking that my purpose is my business. 
It's not. It's so much bigger than that. And it's infused into my business. And it's infused in my creative writing, too. <laughs> you know, they get to have different containers. <laughs>